So I'm here with Julie Canlis. Most of you probably know Julie. Uh, she was in on several classes when we did the John discussion. Did the, um, oh gosh, I just, I went blank on the Advent series that we did. You guys did the Advent series, have spoken at several open table conferences, and we're just excited to have you. Um, so I wanted to ask you, first of all, what's your, what's your background? What's your history with the book of Revelation? Uh, is it something that always fascinated you? Did you avoid it? Like, I, I don't know. Well, I couldn't avoid it because at all the youth gatherings we had, we would always have to watch some kind of left behind, you know, video to really get us excited for evangelism and for what's going to happen. And um, so at least that kind of apocalyptic end of the world being something quite terrible and a way to motivate us was a part of um, my formative spirituality growing up. But I also had this dear, dear grandpa who loved Hal Lindsey. And he would listen to his radio program while he worked on people's teeth. He was a dentist. I don't know how he got away with this. He wouldn't, he wouldn't be able to do this today. But he had that radio on the entire day from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. And I was his dental assistant in the summers. So Ooh. I would listen to all this stuff. And it would just, you know, kind of wash over me as my grandpa's drilling. And, but it slowly seeps in. You know, the images, um, especially when taken literally and pulled apart and examined and, you know, cubed for numbers and square rooted and, you know, all this stuff, it's, um, it just becomes, you don't know it, but you're being taught how you have to read the book of Revelation. And once you're kind of set in that way, you don't know any other way to read the book of Revelation. And so you kind of approach it um, with mystery, reverence, fear, and you know you need a guide. You need a really good guide mm. who's really good at the imagery and explaining what the numbers mean and, and no one normal could ever understand it. So um, <laughs> I think just kind of a ambivalent, uh, just an ambivalent experience of revelation um, would characterize my growing up. Yeah, we, we have similar backgrounds in that. <laughs> At least, at least in the way that it was read to us and the way that we were taught to read it and look yeah. at it. I, I liken it a lot of times to, it's almost like um, they approach the book of Revelation like a letter from Paul. Yeah. Like yeah. we're going to read this just like a letter Yeah. because, you know, it starts off with letters to these seven churches. Yeah. So, but then they read the whole thing that way. And, and that's kind of how, you know, that's how I was, was taught it. So but, uh, for me, one so, of the most, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, no go, go ahead. I was just going to say one of the most helpful this, things this, for me was maybe a decade ago, someone who knew Greek explained to me uh, just even in the opening line, you know, the revelation or the, yeah, the revelation, the apocalypse, the unveiling, um, not from Jesus Christ, but more of Jesus Christ, probably both from and of, but the fact that it was right. about Jesus suddenly made it not scary. Like that, that was the first light bulb that this doesn't have to be scary. Um, if it's a revelation of him, it can be trusted and I've been reading it wrong. And so that was kind of my first like exploratory foray into understanding if this is about Jesus, then I don't have to be afraid. Yeah. So that yeah. was, that was the beginning. But then that raises more questions, right? Oh yeah. If it's about if it's about Jesus, then why all this wrath and violence yeah. and yeah, then which what, what looks which like yeah. violence? So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, and I I think every, so many times our journeys, at least for me and my life, and maybe it's just because I'm an idiot, I don't know. But so many times when I when I learn things, it's because I started by saying. I'm not reading this right, or I'm mm -hmm. not thinking about this right. I need to, I need to look elsewhere. And, and that's when I start to learn, you know, up until then, as long as I think I'm right, no need to, no need to go research. Right. <laughs> I got that one down. Let's move on. Yeah, <laughs> anyway. but that's, that's how we were trained to read the Bible. Oh, Get yeah. it right. And then you can move on. Then it's, then the book is closed. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's true. It's true. So um, 
you know, we were, we were delighted to have you on as many times as we could when we discussed the gospel of John. And so I'm excited to have you, you know, wanting to be back with us for the book of revelation. And I'm just curious, like, what are you looking forward to about it? Um, uh, because obviously I would assume now you're already starting to prepare and think about the book, maybe starting to read it. I don't know. Um, <laughs> you can say no, it's okay. It's summer. It's I've, I've August. Actually, and, I've actually so. been finding my way to revelation through quite a different route. Um, and it's been a really exciting and encouraging route. I was listening to the Regent college podcasts and I happened to hear the one by Dr. Marion Taylor who has become this specialist on women Bible interpreters in the 1800s, 17 and 1800s. And I was like, there were women Bible interpreters in the 17 and 1800s. And she didn't know this either, um, but she's been discovering that yes, there's actually quite a, quite, quite a load of women interpreters, uh, many of whom wrote under anonymous, although we're, mm. she doesn't assume any of those, you know, she won't take those as being women, even though they can have a very feminine style and she's pretty sure, um, but she had to go to the British library. Yeah, how do you find women when you don't even know what their names are and you don't know, you know, what the titles of their books are? So they started putting in the author was Mrs. Um, and the category mm. was religion. And she just started going that way. And suddenly all these uh, Bible interpreters who were women writing commentaries, translating, started popping up in the British library to her total excitement. And no one, no one knows about this. So she's mm. researching this um, and discovering it and finding, going and finding these books, many of which have never been pulled from the shelves ever. Um, she, she, she begins categorizing and finding out where are women camping? Um, what books are they camping around? Because they mostly are writing, they're drawn to the texts that really impact them as women. Mm -hmm. So a lot of women talking about Genesis, you know, and really looking at Genesis one, two, three. Um, and then women are drawn to Paul, not drawn to the prophets very much, the Old Testament prophets, but Paul because of his difficult texts. Um, and then the final place that women are camping out is in Revelation. And I'm thinking, I would have never in a million years predicted that. So I actually called her up afterwards. I was, I just had said, Marion, I have to talk to you about this. Why women? Why revelation? And so she and I um, were just wondering together. And, well, I'll tell you what it then made me think of. I started thinking about the slave Bible um, that I went and saw at the Museum of the Bible, which is a specific edition that was released for slaves. And it omits Exodus and Revelation. Wow. Wow. Um, and so you suddenly I'm like, hmm. Um, so this slave bit Bible, they didn't want slaves to have this incredible narrative of people of slavery being declared to be wrong, of them finding, you know, departing and going for the promised land. But also, why would have they taken out Revelation? Because that's where this, you know, hope, this millennial hope of freedom and equality, where all of the tears are going to be wiped away, you know, that's the other. So they almost take away their eschatological hope as well, you know, mm -hmm. in this slave Bible. And yet, as what I know, which is not very much about all the African American spirituals, many of much of the language is coming from the book of Revelation. So there's something very powerful about this new world, this new heaven, this new earth, where there will be equality. So that's what Marion and I were just wondering about together is women are drawn to this millennial hope of finding equality. And even um, Christina Rossetti, who we all know for her poetry, she's writing commentaries. She's, she's writing commentaries and camping out around Revelation because this is where it's gonna be a new heaven and a new earth. Um, so that's been kind of my like really random um, side <laughs> research that I've been doing just about these women interpreters who are doing works and commentaries on the book of Revelation in the 17 and 1800s. Um, I'm not doing a deep dive, but it's more kind of a sociological wonder um, about why this was such a source of hope for them and why they wanted to interpret it, comment upon it, do the Greek for it. Um, so that's what I've been thinking a lot about. And I think that's what I'm excited about for the Revelation class is getting to know the book of Revelation better um, and seeing it through the through the lens of these women in the 1800s who are mm -hmm saying that this that this book is what is drawing them because they see in this book something that is liberating 
Uh, it also, I pray, draws all of us all into a, the new creation more. And what does it mean? What is this kind of underside of the tapestry? If the gospels are the front of the tapestry, giving us the history and the narrative of what happened, I almost sometimes see Revelation as the backside of the tapestry of this is what was happening in the principalities and the powers. And this is how the forces were being dealt with, even though we just see this, um, this man put on a cross and, you know, his life ended. So that's, I think that's where I'm excited is to see the underside of the tapestry, which has been hope for uh, many people who have experienced gross inequality, who have not tasted of the new creation in their lived experiences, but who have staked their hope on it um, mm -hmm. and in the one who is the new creation. Uh, that's exciting. Uh, and I'm now you got me excited to hear what you're going to bring. Uh, <laughs> I'm from, excited too. From all that. So um, have you, uh, are you familiar with Trevor Hart's book, Hope Against Hope? Yes, I am. Yeah, yeah. And, and I just find that, uh, I just thought that that was a really, uh, I'm trying to think of the right way to say it. It was, just, it was not only challenging, but it, it, it just felt so balanced. So the equilibrium just felt right as I read it. And mm -hmm. Um, and then I come to find out that he's friends with Baxter Kruger and has taught over in Aberdeen, pastor to church and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, wow, this guy's great. Um, he's great. He's so. a, a genuinely good human being. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, thank you so much for spending a few minutes with us and we're excited We're it's hard to believe that we're just a little over a month away from starting this, it, you know, because we've been looking forward to it now for months, but uh, I'm really excited about it and so glad you're going to be a part of it. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John. It'll be okay. great. I'm happy, happy and excited and anxious to get back together into this kind of rhythm. Me too. I, it, it, it was, you know, it was, I'm not, I should say this because maybe people don't know this, but uh, for us, the panels, it was the highlight of our week to get together and talk um, because we were always learning from one another and just the spirit and uh, the humility and the appreciation of each other. I, it was just wonderful. And uh, I hope people, I hope people can see that and that that encourages them. Um, Cause I know a lot of people have felt, uh, as they, as they begin to dive deeper into this conversation that we're having, there's a lot that have been uh, what ostracized maybe, or just feel uncomfortable in the church settings that they're in or the study groups or whatever. So I hope that encourages them. But thanks again, just excited for it. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, it's great. It's great to be here and it'll be great to be back together in the autumn. Thanks.